The Iowa Hawkeyes defeated on the road this evening, 63-61 at the Breslin Center in East Lansing. I'm Corey Brad here from the Hawkeye of the Storm, joined by former Iowa assistant coach Gary Close. The Hawkeyes, uh, a valiant effort tonight, Gary. A lot to get to uh, on both ends. Um, I've got some thoughts on on where this game was lost. I'm sure you do as well. I know people in the chat are upset about free throw shooting. Uh just give me your overall takeaways from what I thought to be a really resilient performance in a horrendously difficult place to play. Yeah. And facing a team that's you know going to go, going to go on the road, Michigan state that hasn't played two really tough games. So, and uh, they had come off a, you know, really bad loss where they got annihilated by Indiana, got physically beat up. And usually that's not a good time to be playing Michigan state. And, you go on the road, you want to have a chance to uh, win it in the end, and they did, and, and drew up a great play, had a great look. Uh, pass was a little a little low. I think that threw him off a little bit, but he still had a pretty good look and and unfortunately didn't make it because that would have been a terrific way to end the game. Uh, but uh, you're right. They um, they played hard and, and uh, gave themselves a chance to win. That's what you want to do on the road, especially a tough place like that. And uh, I would say both looks were pretty good, right? I mean, even the second one, I understand yeah. that you got a guy yeah. in your face, but you know, Peyton has made those shots. He's six eight. I mean, he got a pretty good look at it from the Iowa sideline, from the Iowa bench. Yeah, no, and I, I, I thought I even was talking to my daughter. I said, let's let's knock a three down and, and win, and uh, yep, and they agree. drew up the play perfectly and got a good look and and uh, just didn't go down. So. Um, uh, but like we said, they, 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 they were in position to win the game and, and a few things here or there, and they could have very easily done it. So it's a tough loss in that respect. The miss by Hogarth in the front end of the one and one. And of course, uh, I, I don't know if the, you know, what Iowa didn't seem to get into their stuff very well. there. called the timeout with eight seconds, but I said the same thing you did, Gary. I said to a friend of mine, as I'm watching the game, I said, let's get a three. Uh, and, and I thought, well, maybe you maybe you take out Ulyss and you put in Dix in that situation. Fran opts to go with Ulyss, but I mean it was well executed, right? Can you can you maybe break down? I mean, you probably saw it a couple times on replay. Can you give us an idea of what happened on that play? I mean, obviously for the average fan, you're watching it; it goes very fast. Rebracha came out, set a beautiful screen for, uh, I believe it was Rebracha set the screen for for Sanford on the open shot. Yeah, and they ran kind of a uh, you know almost use Chris as a decoy, throwing that long cross court pass and it kind of gets everybody looking that direction. And then, you know, Sanford comes back off a real good screen and had a real good look. It's a, you know, it's a play they've obviously run before and ran it well. And that's all you can ask for. You just, uh, you know, hopefully it goes down. It didn't, but it was right there. And, and uh, so I thought it was a good decision, good execution. Just the shot just didn't drop. I just want to say something real quick as it relates to the people in the chat. So many negative comments in the chat and everybody has a right to say what you want in the chat, but I, I don't understand the negativity in any way. I see people ripping Iowa for free throw shooting. Uh, Gary, they didn't shoot the, they didn't shoot from the line very well. I mean, it's six to 13 or bad from the free throw line today, 46%, but I don't know if people are aware they are second in the conference in free throw shooting during conference play second. So anybody who says, Oh, piss poor free throw shooting, you're not going to make the tournament. You're living in the moment. You don't have perspective. Am I right in that, Gary? Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, you know, when you lose a game like this and and you shoot six for 13, it, there's a lot of what ifs there. Uh, but you you could point to some other areas as well. But um, it's probably a little more frustrating in the sense that they are a good free throw shooting team. This is sure. you feel pretty exactly. good about it. Uh, but um, it's going to happen. No, here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like yeah. That, especially on the road. Yep. yep. No doubt. Yep. Um. Obviously, Iowa struggled from three. Didn't take a ton of threes. Just seventeen for the game. Three is seventeen. And again, I'm, I'm tonight. I'm a glass half full kind of guy. And maybe you'd say more often than not, I'm a glass half empty as it relates to Iowa losses. But I thought that defensively, Iowa was really good a lot of this game, uh, especially the first few minutes of the game. I thought Iowa set the tone defensively. 
Um, I thought struggled to rebound at times on that end as the game wore on. I'm sure Fran would would say the same thing. Gave up some open threes, but for the most part, I mean, comparatively, you look back at the game in Columbus on Saturday, just a 180 defensively. Your thoughts? Yeah, I thought the same thing. I thought their uh, containing of the ball was much better. Um, did not get it. You know, we, we talked about how bad they were buried in the paint. Um, that was not the case um, today. In fact, I thought Michigan State – uh, really played in Iowa's hands. They took a lot of two-point jump shots, and that's why their two-point percentage was not very good. Um, and their threes, a few frees they made, bailed them out. Um, but uh, I thought defensively they played well enough to win the game. They, uh, they just didn't uh, just didn't make you know a couple more shots that would have would have been the difference. Really imp- impressed with Aaron Eulis. I mean, this is a, I've said that a couple times here the last few weeks, Gary, that he's playing better and better. And I would reiterate the same thing and yeah he had 17 points and you look at that and you say well he played well but I mean he he was he drew a pretty uh heavy assignment on the defensive end um I mean I I would I would guess that you would agree that uh playing ball denial on on some of the one of the best guard courts in the country uh featuring Tyson Walker that that can gas a guy and Aaron played a lot of minutes uh in the game played 35 minutes a lot of ball denial defense, and yet still was huge on offense. This is this was something we hadn't seen from Aaron. No, probably is uh, probably easily his best game of the year, both both ends of the court, and and um, you know he liked to have those free throws back, obviously, and the turnover there late. Uh, but he looked like he played with a lot more confidence. He was much better finishing around the basket. Um, yeah, I thought he I thought he played really really well, and we needed it because uh, Tony was not. Um, as good as he'd been recently. And so we needed somebody to pick him up and Aaron did. Yeah. And he missed three free throws. We acknowledge that, but I think they were in this game. They had a chance to win this game in large part due to the efforts of Aaron Eulis. I'd agree. And he's probably the last guy you'd expect heading into the game to, to think, Hey, he's going to be the difference maker. But it seemed to me, and he, I know Tony Perkins didn't have a great game offensively. He's two of five, uh, six points. But I thought both of those guys, you could tell when this game started, I mean, they set the tone, right, uh, as starters. I thought they were the guys that showed the biggest change from Saturday. I'm, I'm guessing they took – I'm sure Fran challenged those two guys because the backcourt has not been good enough, especially defensively. And I thought both of those guys, including Tony Perkins, on that end set the tone for this team. Um, I, I guess we can address officiating. I, I texted you during the game, Gary, and I said, uh, I don't think this game is – been well officiated at all that was in the first half I thought it was marginally better in the second half here's why I I say that Gary uh and I know I know you you know you coached (laughs) how many years during the Izzo era I'm just tired of going into the Breslin Center and it being a wrestling match and games being officiated differently in East Lansing so or I'm I'm, I want to add you you we have not talked about this prior to now but do you believe this game was well officiated by Courtney Green and company well, I, I don't think it decided the game. I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, I'm guessing Mission State had more fouls. Uh, I don't know what the free throws ended up being. I, I think we were close in free throws attempted. I think there were some questionable calls for both teams. Um, so, I, you know, I've said it a lot of times. I, I For me to evaluate a fishing, I, I almost got to go back and look at it and run it back and forth and, and just, uh, which is easy to do, uh, rather than trying to, make a decision off, off of just watching the game live. But I, I didn't get the impression that they had a deciding effect. When you go play there, you got to understand that's the way it's going to be. You go to Purdue, that's the way it's going to be. Um, and you just got to, you got to be ready for it. And um, what do you mean that when you go to Michigan state, that's the way it's going to be. What does that mean? It's going to be a physical basketball game. So and, but that's my problem with it, Gary. Why, why does it, because it's Tom Izzo and, and the Spartan. That's my problem. It's not about, I'm not talking about individual calls. I don't think I don't know how it's okay for officials to allow the, the level of physicality that they allow at the Breslin Center and not at other places. That's what I see from. Yeah, I, I think some people will say that's not the case. I mean, it, it may or may not be. I, I don't think it was overly physical tonight at, at either end of the court. Um, but it, going back and watch that, I might I might change my I might change my tune. But my point is, when you play Michigan State, it's going to be physical. That's just the way it's going to be. Rebounding, defending, and um, 
you got to be prepared for that. I made the comment during the game, either Michigan State is really good at swatting and knocking the ball out, or there's a lot of missed calls. I thought there were a lot of those types of situations. Uh, but again, it is what it is. And uh, perspective is, and I'm trying not to live in the moment, but uh, I, this is sort of one of those things that over the course of many years, and we've heard this narrative, Gary, in recent years that, and I think even there, there has been talk from Big Ten coaches about we we need to officiate differently because when you allow hand checking and you're allowing all these this extracurricular these things that maybe other conference officials don't allow it's wearing your teams down come march and there has been little big 10 success in the tournament recent seasons and i just feel like a game like this is proof of that and maybe i'm wrong you have thoughts on on that well, if I would, I, I wouldn't use officiating as an excuse for not doing well in the NCAA tournament. I, I think that's a cop out. Um, now, it, you know, the officiating might be a little bit different in the NCAA tournament um, because in that situation, as we've talked about, those officials are are evaluated just like the teams are. And if they don't have a well officiated game, according to the people that are evaluating the game, then they don't advance. Uh, but, and, and it's, um, I mean, we, we do see, um, you know, a lot of the same officials in our league because our league is, is, is the top league to officiate in, but it's, you know, officials work all over the place. Uh, so um, I, I didn't think, I didn't think it was that bad. Like I said, if I went back and look at it, I might change my tune totally, but um, I thought the game was fairly officiated for the most part. Lomansky, appreciate the super chat. Only Purdue and Wildcats have winning records on the road and need to protect the home court. And I think this goes back to, I, I'm not making excuses here, Gary, just like you're not making excuses with as it relates to March Madness and officiating, but that game on Wednesday being canceled, I know you can't look back at that, especially as players and coaches, you can't go back and say, well, if only we had played Wednesday. But to have that fifth game in a row, potentially a win at home, uh, I don't know, it just, it, it just sits – wrong with me now that you've got a two game losing streak granted both those games have been on the road and now you're going back home for a three game homestand but you're talking about a, a very quick turnaround on each of those games i don't know you just wonder maybe what would be different but if you protect home court over the next three they're in good shape well you got them at home when you play in the ncaa tournament you got to play uh if you win you got to play two days later and so that's how you look at it hey come on uh <laughs> northwestern is the one that went through all the covid and uh and then they they beat Wisconsin after not playing for nine days and being sick. And then two days later, they go down to Nebraska and beat them. So right. um, I think we just got to suck it up. And um, we're playing at home. And uh, if you're going to play well in the NCAA tournament, you're going to have to play one. You're playing the Big Ten tournament. You're going to play the next day. So that's just an excuse. Let's let's go. Um, let's not use that as a reason why we can't win these three games. They're not going to be easy, obviously, but. Um, we play like we played tonight defensively and shoot a little bit better. We got a chance to win all three of those games, and that's the way we got to look at it. I think you just brought up an excellent point, Gary. They are all three of them are at home, and there have been situations in the past since the COVID year where games have been postponed, Iowa games have been postponed, and you're having to go on the road and then come right. home. They're all at home, so yeah. you know I don't know that you love it. as a coach. What do you prefer? Do you prefer to be able to go home, home, road, road, home, and kind of back and forth, or do you prefer four at home, three on the road, two more at home. I mean, how do you prefer that as a coach? Yeah, that's a good question. I guess it depends on how you're playing. Um, I think I'd probably prefer more broken up evenly rather than having a bunch at one, a bunch of the other. But, you know, you look at if you got if you got a bunch on the road and you can win a few and then you go home, boy, we could really, we could really get some momentum going. So, um, you know, Wisconsin complained about going down to Northwestern and having to go to Maryland and they get beat because they use it as an excuse. Um, my God, you had to drive two and a half hours to play a basketball game against a team that hasn't practiced for seven days and, and been sick? Come on. That's just an excuse. And then they get on a private plane and go down to Maryland 48 hours and play. Come on. I mean, it's just, hey. Uh, and I think it also is disrespectful to teams that beat them. Um, and you're going to blame it on, uh, you know, the schedule and traveling and stuff like that. That's, that's a bunch of baloney. Just, um, uh, you know, just find a way to win. Uh, and, and I, I think what it does, it, 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 uh, it prevents you from looking at the real reasons why you're losing. 
Um, and then you don't get better if you don't do that. One more comment about the chat. I, I am really, I mean, I'm not ripping people in the chat. I'm just so amazed by the negativity because here this team shoots 17.6% from three. They shoot 46% from the free throw line. Those are two things they typically do very well, do Gary. Well. On offense. Mm -hmm. And they, they had a three, they had two threes to win in East Lansing. And we're sitting here pissing and moaning about it. I just don't, I don't get that at all. And believe me, Gary, you know, I've pissed and moaned plenty of times on yeah. this show, but I, it's not coming for me tonight. So everybody has a right to their own opinions, but, and by the way, the same people who are like, Oh, we're not going to be able to have tournament success. Probably the same people that said Iowa had no shot of winning the big 10 tournament last year. So let's, uh, let's get to our first caller. We're going to try to keep our calls moving somewhat steady this evening. <laughs> uh, Breakdown and uh, time with Coach Close. Let's get to Cody, who is here out of the gates. Cody, welcome to the show. How are you guys? Hey, Cody. Good to see you. I was just wondering what you thought. I was surprised Fran really didn't seem to be on the officials that much. What do you think gets him going sometimes to where he goes nuclear on these guys? I thought for sure he was going to come unglued on a few of those possessions, especially stuff in the post. Seems like we couldn't. I'm, I don't like the excuse for – you know, not getting foul calls, but if it seemed like a few of those, it's like, well, you know, if we could get that call, you know, maybe they aren't quite as aggressive and hammering down on things, but it didn't seem for like, especially with Courtney green, I know him and Fran have a little bit of a history. So I just was surprised. What do you think led to him not really going after them much, or at least it didn't show it on TV anyway. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I don't, I don't think so either. I don't know if that's an indication they thought they were, doing a decent job of officiating because um, usually he's not like that. If, if he doesn't think something's happened the right way, he'll certainly let people know. So I'd be curious myself. I, I really don't know. My, my Cody, my thought on it, because I said the same thing during the game and, and you heard my, I mean, Gary and I have a difference of opinion on this. Neither of us have watched the game back, but I, I do think it's officiated different in East Lansing, but my opinion on perhaps theory, I should say as to why Fran may not have lost his cool at any point really at any point he got upset with on a lane violation that was missed. You probably saw that, but for the most part, he was composed. And I wonder if it's not Fran has learned that going after the officials there does absolutely nothing. Right. Izzo's in their ears all night long. And I just don't think, I mean, I, I don't, you already mentioned the, the maybe some issues. I don't want to say personal issues, but there's been a history between Courtney green and Fran McCaffrey. You're in East Lansing. You, the students are right on top. Of you. I just wonder if in that situation, Fran is probably smart enough to say, not going to do any good. I just got to put my head down and coach. That would be my reaction, but maybe, he, maybe Gary's right. Maybe he thought the official officiating was fine. Yeah. Uh, your, your thoughts. Good one too. It could very well be that as well. Um, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a psychological game. You know, you work in officiating is, is an art. And uh, so you gotta, you kind of go, got to go with your gut and, and, um, do things that you think are going to be effective. And maybe that's exactly uh, what he thought. It seems like, um, you know, the is zone that's that student section, they, they can sense blood in the water. And I feel maybe, maybe he would think that would play into them getting even more involved in the game too. So maybe he was trying to, yeah, could be, but uh, yeah. for how I wanted to say too, like the whole deal with Aaron, that was a fantastic game from Aaron. If we can get that going forward, yeah. You have a few turnovers. I mean, those guys play tough defense. He handled the ball a ton. I mean, I think Corey, like you said, I'm sure he was gassed. I mean, you get you start losing your legs a little bit after you play a long time and stuff. So it's like so you miss a front end or two. I mean, I don't know. To me, I thought that was fantastic. And that's a step ahead for him. And he's this that's is gonna turn. I mean, give me that all day, twice on Sunday. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. Let me just read real quick. To, uh, these are the two stats. So Tyson Walker, uh, four of fourteen from the field. 10 points, five assists. Aaron Eulis, eight of 10 from the field, one of one from three, 0 of three from the free throw line, three assists, 17 points. I'm taking Aaron Eulis' stat line every day of the week. So I'm not saying you're going to get that every day of the week in every game in the schedule, but what you said I think rings true. No, and those are against two good guards. That's not, uh, you know, those aren't bad guards they're going against. So some people think they're the best backcourt in the league. Yeah. Uh, so um, that's impressive. My favorite thing too is just like you could tell he was kind of, he was not thinking either. You could tell like that shot he pulled it. He was going nice hesitation moves, um, getting to the cup, 
Like, I mean, he, he, he had a purpose. I, sometimes I feel like he's dribbling, like, and he's getting some rhythm dribbles, trying to figure out, you know, probing a little bit, but he was aggressive tonight. And I'm like, that's, yeah. 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 That's the best he's finished all year. He, he really, he has struggled in, in that regard a lot, uh, putting up bad shots or low percentage shots. And he finished really well tonight. That flips a switch on him for the rest of the year. I'll take this loss. Definitely. We can. Yeah, definitely. Thank you guys. Nice talk. All right. Thanks for, call. Thanks for calling. In. Good stuff. Yeah. I, I, I just, uh, everybody has a right to their opinion. I just don't, uh, I don't know how you could not be. Well, happy if, the, if the three point shot had gone in, everybody would be just. Oh, thrilled. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's just, that's the way sports is. It's crazy. And again, uh, Gary, that, that both, especially the first one, you, you're right. The pass from Chris is a little low, but you cannot ask for a better shot from a, a better shooter in a situation like that than what was drawn up. And I will give Fran credit for this. And I think you'll agree on this. Was it, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the guy that, uh, name escapes me, but a recent, recent analyst on ESPN, um, I can picture his face, but he, he made the comment that there's nobody better in the business than Fran at drawing plays up out of bounds, especially under the basket. We saw that early in the game. Or, or would you agree with that? Fran, it, he is an artist as it relates to, to getting looks in those situations. Yeah, no, they, they, they do a great job with that. Uh, both in line as well as side OB on the road to get a shot like that in eight seconds. Um, I, I thought it was a great, great, great execution, great call. And, uh, and everybody would just be thrilled if that thing had gone in and it gives Peyton confidence, you know, even if he missed it, it gives him, Hey, that, my coach drew that up for me. wanted me to knock that thing down. I, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of him next time. So it's too bad it didn't go in because it really would have been a terrific way to end the game. Let's get to Tony. Who's been on hold since the beginning. Tony, welcome to the show. How you doing guys? Hi, right, Tony. Um, I mentioned this to you on Twitter, Corey, and I don't know, uh, coach Courtney green has worked nonstop since Friday. He has not had a day off since Friday. And well, you, I, you, you got the best of the best is much, uh, coveted Tony. Yeah, I, I, I guess, I guess it is. I, I'm not blaming him on the law and I don't, I'm not blaming the officials at all on this loss, but just, is there that much of a shortage of officials in college as well? Because I mean, we know it is in high school, but no, they they uh, a lot of these guys. This is where they make their bread, and it's a short season, so they're gonna they're gonna ref as many games as they can get. Some don't want as heavy a schedule. Some want as big a schedule as they can possibly have, and and um, and so. Yeah, you'll you'll see that where they'll have four or five games in a row with all that travel. That's not easy to do for sure, uh, but it's not uncommon. It, uh, and I don't know. Maybe they need more time off, but I mean, it is their income and their job, so I really can't mm -hmm. say don't do that. Unfortunately, right? Um, it, it it's just uh, frustrating because the the free throw shooters who missed are normally good free throw shooters. Like right. I knew you, Ulysses is a uh, 80 plus. 80. Percent. Like, yep. Yeah. Yep. I mean, and it yep. was just, we, we better be fortunate. We're fortunate yeah. that Rebracha, who's a, a low sixties percent free throw shooter made. I mean, what was he on the night? He, he made it. I know he made two or three of three. Yeah. Uh, he, yeah, I can give it to you here. He was uh two of three. So, I mean, for the fact that I mean, he could have easily been one of three. Or Chris Murray was one of three. Aaron Yost was zero of three. Um, Bowen was one of two. They didn't get to the line very much. I mean, they no. just didn't get to the line very much. And that's, you know, I just would have wished in a game that is physical against Michigan State on the road. You get well, not you don't expect it on the road, but you you get what I'm saying. A game that's this physical, you get to the line a little bit more. It was it was frustrating because I think they got to the bonus or one foul away from the bonus, like quickly in both halves and then the fouls just seemed to dry up or I don't know, maybe they didn't, maybe they didn't attack enough. You know, if, if you look at it, yeah. um, I, I do like the, the schedule that we get with uh Northwestern. I think that'll be their like fifth game in nine days or something like that. So we're going to catch that. Yeah. We have that short turnaround with the sat side or sorry, Sunday to Tuesday, but, Northwestern's going to be on the end of a 
absolutely brutal stretch after recovering from COVID. Right. So uh, I think getting that, and then there's a break until Saturday, I think. So it's like Sunday, Tuesday, Saturday or something. Mm-hmm. Like that. Now, are we uh, changing our schedule due to your Eagles coach? We'll, have to, talk, to- we'll have to talk about that. <laughs> 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 yes. uh, what time do the Eagles play it's Sunday? They play at three, right after the Iowa two. game. No, they play at two, right in the middle. Or of two, Iowa. or two. Sorry, two. I was thinking time. The game is it, The game is at uh, one. 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 So uh... <laughs> I'm going to be setting up two TVs in my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll That's keep good. you posted on programming for that that day. Uh, I know last time we had. Uh, we had a guest, I think. I think Tony would love to be the guest uh, host with you, Corey. No, Gary. <laughs> last time we did this, I mean, and I'm I'm the one who prompted this last time. But last time we did it, we did a late. I don't know when the second NFL. When's the second game? It doesn't end. It's not a late game. It probably starts at what five thirty. Well, it probably starts. Yeah, like five thirty. We could potentially do it in that. You know, after that game, we can talk about it off the air. We don't got to yeah. out of here, but uh, yeah. we don't want to. We don't want to mess up the NFC Championship game, so. No, for I'm sure. I'm just, I'm just at a loss for words because it's tough to lose something like this when you just had it at your fingertips, and it yeah, would have been, a, it would have been a great win because I yeah. honestly going in, I did not expect them to win, especially no. after how bad Michigan State looked against Indiana. They were beaten up, and we're not even in that game, and uh, that's that doesn't usually happen. So, I guarantee you, their practice past week have been a bear, and so I. I thought they were running into a hornet's nest. So got off to a great start, which really helped. But uh, on the flip side, Gary, Iowa looked really bad against Ohio State, State especially on defense. So yep, indi- all indicators were both of these coaches, both of these teams probably had some good practices leading up to tonight. Yep. I thought they both played really hard, especially on defense. Yep, no, I agree. And that's got to be – where would you rank the Breslin for toughest play, road venues to go to? Oh, it'd be right up at the top. Yeah, I'd say – I say them and Purdue and Indiana are probably the three toughest places to play. You know, it changes a little bit year to year, but those three fans usually show up thick or thin and are pretty involved. Yeah. And it just, they, they had an answer every time it seemed like. So that's why I just, it's frustrating because the game was right there and they, they played calm and they didn't jack up threes that much. You know, when it seemed like Michigan state was getting on a run, they were very composed and just couldn't close it out. But yeah. Yeah. Hopefully it's a learning experience. And, you know, like the last caller said, hopefully this catapults you list. So uh, thanks for your time. And we'll see you guys on Sunday. All right. Take care. Yeah. And uh, I, I acknowledge Ryan in the chat. He says, well, you did have six turnovers. That, that's true. Um, a couple he had some bad turnovers. He, he That's where he's got. It. I mean, I thought the, right, well, the one right before half, uh, he drove into the middle of the lane and he had three guys wide open. And uh, one for a lap, one for a wide open three. I think another one for three. And or no, or actually, I think Rebracho was wide open at the elbow. He has a tendency to take it into traffic, and he's not strong with the ball. And then you get a reputation, and then they come after you. So he's he's got to get stronger with the ball. That was his one negative. Uh, and otherwise, it was a real good game. I'm pulling up a stat here. I just want to confirm this before I speak out of turn. So, uh, again, counting today, of course, had six turnovers. Um, where are turnovers here? Uh, let's see. 13, I think they had today. Well, I'm not looking for team stats here. I just was looking for the last few games. So, Euless had four turnovers against Ohio State, but zero against Michigan, zero against Maryland. So, I guess my point is he has cleaned up his turnover issue to an extent. So not saying it's okay. I, I understand what you're saying, especially early in the year. He had some games where he just was constantly out of control. But I do think he's played better and and has protected the ball better. These last two games on the road, the entire team has been too careless with the basketball. Um, well, six is too many. What's that? They said they're heading for six turnovers tonight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's too many. I'm acknowledging it's too many. I'm just yeah. saying in in general, recent pattern of behavior has not been he's not been averaging six he's probably been averaging right. yeah so in the last few games their their games where they have a team they only have six so when your right. one guy's got six that that's a concern 
Yeah, they had 13 tonight, and he was yeah. almost half of those. But he, he logged a lot of minutes, had the ball in his hands a lot. I'm not making excuses for him. It goes to show you how important turnovers are. You know, 13 is not an incredibly bad number. It's it's a little high for Iowa. You know, they have 10. Maybe the uh, maybe the outcome is different. Uh, that's why um, you know that's why that ball ball security is so important, and um, a little bit better ball security tonight what might have might have made the difference. Before we get to our next caller, want to give a shout out to. Let's get uh, this comment off of here and get the banner off of there. Brad Van Meter and his team down at State Farm appreciate Brad sponsoring the programming here, the post game show with Coach Patterson. If you have a need for an insurance quote, give Brad and his team a chance to serve you better by calling him at 515-256-6480. Get you great rates and, of course, personalized coverage. They'll review your policy with you annually. You got a small team, but again, uh, they are working for you and your needs, your values. So again, give him and his team a chance to support you and your family by means of great insurance. Visit him online at www.bradvanmeter.com or visit him in person. At 4229 Fleur Drive down in Des Moines. All right, let's get to our next caller on the phone line. Thank you for calling Iowa Post Game with Coach Gary Close. Who's on the line? Hello, you're on the air. No. No, they're not. Let's get to Ryan. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Um Coach, I hope you're rooting for the 49ers in the Super Bowl if and when they win. But uh, beyond that, um, my question for you, Coach, and you you as well, Corey, is what about who is Iowa's true alpha point guard? So, you know, the Maryland game it was clearly Perkins. Many games – you you could say it's Connor. A couple games has been Josh Dix, for God's sakes, who was pretty irrelevant today. And then you also have uh, Euless today, but three turnovers or six turnovers and three assists, even though he scored really well. I mean, it's like we got four really capable guys. And yet, we don't know who the elf is. Yeah, there's because... consistency, Ryan. It's just right, Gary. I mean, they've all what he what Ryan just said is true. All those guys have had really good performances. It's a matter of, I mean, you you as a coach, can you talk about what it takes to coach and breed consistency, especially with uh, a backcourt? Well, it's the toughest position to play, bar none. I mean, it's like the quarterback in football. I mean, you. you um, it's difficult handling the ball, calling plays, getting everybody organized, and then you know trying to make plays yourself. And and uh, I don't know if they have a true point guard in any of those four. It's been kind of point guard by committee, and and uh, it's probably the way they've got to go. I don't. There's nobody in that group that just stands out as uh, heads and shoulders above anybody else. And literally, as you mentioned, all of them have had their moments, uh, from Connor to the other three that you mentioned. So. Um, they, they, I think the most important thing is, is being able to take care of the ball and that's where they've got to, they've just got to get better there. And I think they will, I mean, because they've, they've shown, they have been able to do that in the past. So, um, especially on the road. So, uh, but I don't know if it's going to change much. I think it's going to be by committee all year long, unless somebody just comes out of the woodwork and really, really takes the ball and goes with it. But I, I'm not sure that's going to happen. And remember, you, you brought it up, Gary. They, this team has a reputation. I know they've had some weird blips on the radar. I mean, you think back to the Eastern Illinois game, the Nebraska game, but basically, for the most part, if you even go back to the Seton Hall game, they have taken care of the basketball to an exceptional extent, even though mm -hmm. the backcourt has not been consistently well as far as scoring and even defense at times, but they've taken care of the basketball. We've even we've raved about that on this very show at how Iowa plays so fast and yet doesn't turn the ball over. So I, I agree with you. I, I mean, I think if you have confidence in Fran McCaffrey for anything, certainly it's on the offensive end and it's cleaning up the turnovers. Um, I'd be more concerned down the stretch, Ryan, with can Iowa continue to defend 
at the level that they did tonight. Well, to that that point, Corey, to that point, you know, here's a question I've actually wanted to ask Coach Close and yourself, Corey, for a while. It just seems to me, and it's been for several years, you know, post Tom Davis, we are not real good at defending the three point shot. So today there were 40%. It obviously, we all know this game was very winnable, but it just seems to me like we have a lot of possessions where, you know, the other team has a wide open shot. Maybe it goes in, maybe it doesn't, but I know we play a lot of zone, but what can we do to better defend that three point shot? Because a lot of games are like today where it comes down to a bucket and, You know, irregardless of excellent officiating today, because Courtney Green's a pro, but irregardless of all of that, um, you know, little Larry wasn't in the building and neither was Sleazebag. So, you know. (laughs) Thank you for the call, Ryan. I appreciate it as always, sir. (laughs) Fair points, but. Yeah. uh, I mean, honestly, I, I thought, again, for the most part, they gave up some open threes. And sometimes, you know this, Gary, off of misses uh, and, and not able to secure a defensive rebound, that's what also creates open threes. And you kick it out, and, and they had a couple of those in that second half. I thought Iowa closed out stronger. I made that comment on Twitter in the first half um, than they, they usually do. So I, I don't know about that tonight. I mean, Michigan State, I thought Michigan State, here's the deal, Gary. I thought Michigan State made some difficult shots um, in that first half, especially, I mean, difficult shots. And, and I, I go back to what you always say, make them take tough twos. And I thought early Michigan state made tough twos. Do you know what? I'll bet you Michigan state didn't shoot over 40% tonight. Uh, they shot for the game. They shot, uh, 38.7. And they shot 40% from three. 40%. Yeah, so that means their twos were even less. Um, they took a lot of two-point jump shots. Yeah. If they had lost that game, I guarantee you they would have gone back and said way too many two-point jump shots. And that's good defense to get yes, them to do is. that. They lost a few a few three-point shooters where they got ball watching a little bit or you know, just lost sight of their, their guy and uh or gave up some driving and kicking, but not very much. Um Defensively, they played well enough to win the game. Uh, you shoot three for 17 from three and and 46% for the free throw line. One one more three or a couple more free throws and they win the game. And it's all this conversation is not, uh, you know, it's not even probably even being discussed. Yeah, I, I, to- I totally, totally agree with you. Uh, and, and yeah, you got to give, although Izzo is probably frustrated with this guy settling for some of those twos. No doubt. All of those were well defended. Iowa not allowing deep penetration, not allowing open threes, forces tough twos. Mm-hmm. I'm just right. They made a lot of them. I mean, they actually just made a lot of those difficult twos. And so what do you do? You tip your cap. I thought they made some tough threes. I don't know how many threes they made in the first half. I guess I have that in front of me. They made in the first period, uh, Michigan State made six of 13. They actually shot 46% from three. A lot of those were, were well defended, I thought, Gary. Yeah. And what did they shoot for the game? Eight for 20? Eight for 20. So they're only two for seven in the second half. So they did a better job of cleaning that up. I'm sorry. I read that wrong. Two for seven in the first half, six to 13 in the second half. Yeah. Okay. Reverse that. So yeah. uh, I thought they defended the three really well in the first half. There were some breakdowns in the second, but I live with it, giving up 63 on the road. Uh, Let's get to our next caller on hold. Thank you for calling Iowa post game with Coach Gary Close. Who's on the line? Lomansky, Corey, good evening. Thanks for taking my call. Hey there, Lomansky. How are you? I'm good. Uh, Malik Hall has been out for the Spartans on two separate occasions. He's really key to their team. And I was also gone through that uh, player uh, unavailability with P-Mac and um, Chris. 
And I guess I have Michigan State pretty high on the list of teams. It's going to be there at the end, uh, well coached. I like both your comments. Uh, unfortunately, I went and got a beverage and smiling when we went into the bonus, thinking of all oh, how Iowa wins. And we get to the line, and and it just seemed like the bonus, you know, the whistles didn't blow and the bonus wasn't there. And what's interesting, I um, I got on the internet and the the Michigan State uh, papers quoted Izzo that uh, his center, their tall guy, might not play as much if he doesn't uh, toughen up. And uh, I thought that was very interesting watching Izzo and him on the sidelines. And he had his ups and downs during this game. But comment, Gary, and, and even you, Corey, if you were, if you got that bonus, if you got that bonus advantage, and it just seemed like uh, we got a uh, get out of jail free card and never got to play it. I, I, I don't know how to process that. So maybe you two can help me with that. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. I did. I, I don't quite remember exactly when they, they got into the penalty uh, and what part of the, the game it was. Um, uh, but um, you're probably right. They probably, they probably didn't attack as much as maybe they could have maybe settled a little bit. I don't know what they obviously didn't shoot well from three the whole game. I don't know how it broke down first and second half, but um, I, I thought you know I thought they got the ball to Philip a lot more in the first half to where he he he, he was effective especially early and wasn't as much in the second half. So um, I, I thought Iowa needed to be a little stronger with the ball as well. I thought I thought a couple times they were, they were a little a little loose with it and. Um, it's hard to get calls when you're loose with the ball. You gotta, you gotta be strong with it, or officials just won't give you the call. Corey, you got a thought on that? I agree with everything Gary just said. I mean, you're. Uh, first of all, I don't love it. you. You made a comment about Izzo. Um, I, I just get annoyed watching Izzo on the sideline, um, yeah. but. I, I did. I mean, I thought I think Iowa's done a pretty good job all year defending without fouling. Now they don't always defend well, right? But I don't think normally it's because they're they're hacking. Perfect example of that is Philip Bracha, who for the most part has stayed out of foul trouble almost all year, despite the physicality of this conference and Iowa's lack of depth at that position. And to me, he's you know Chris Murray's maybe one A and and Philip Bracha's one B as far as MVP on this team. I thought Philip had some shots that were some bunnies in this game that he would normally make. I mean, he made some, right? I mean, he for the game, Philip Rebracha was um, for the game at 16 points, 11 boards, and he was uh, seven of 15 from the field. I thought he missed some bunnies there, Gary. That he, he's probably kicking himself on as well. But sure. uh, overall, no, I, 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 Iowa does a pretty good job of defending without fouling. When they're playing good defense, they do a good job defending without fouling. Um, and, yeah, it is frustrating. You get to the bonus early or you get close to the bonus early and you can't buy a foul. But it is what it is. Gary, the other thing is we lost a lot of time because we had so many fouls to give. Yeah. You know, Connor got the third one to get them on the line when we needed to see if they can make their free throws. And I guess – I just, uh, maybe it's a style thing, like Euless is hot. You know, how does Fran say, okay, we're going to call a play to uh, Chris and de-emphasize Aaron, and he's hot because Fran likes to go with a hot hand. And I, I think Fran's style, which I love, when you hand it the baton to the players sometimes, you know, as opposed to Mateen Cleese back in the day, Gary, where, where you've got the second coach on the floor to tell people that uh, – you know, we we've got an advantage in the bonus. Keep going to fill up. Do you do you think the? And I like it. I'm not criticizing Fran, but that do you think in coaching? I'm trying to think. An Iowa coach, which was more uh, maybe Bo at Wisconsin was more controlling from the bench. I might be wrong, Gary. You know, I don't. But uh, maybe you got to live with that. That the players, you know, you've got Connor out there. You got to live with their decisions on the floor. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think uh, you, you don't want your players playing like robots, um, you know. And, and a lot of times they'll see something on the floor that you don't see from the bench. So you want to have communication back and forth. Hey, what do you think about this? What do you see out there? And 
and that's just that's just being a being a good coach because a lot of times they'll see some things that you won't. Um, and um, I think the bottom line is they they put themselves in a great position to win a game against a real good team. And um, you know, a basket here, a free throw there, one less, a couple less turnovers, they get that win, and everybody is thrilled. Uh, in a game, probably most people thought they weren't going to win. So um, there, there are a lot of positives to take from this game. Unfortunately, it didn't come with a win, which would have made it even better. Hey, Gary, if uh, if Corey is irritated with uh, with Izzo, don't you think he'd be just as inter- uh, uh, irritated with Judd Heathcote? Probably. <laughs> or Bobby Knight. <Moore. laughs> I'll, I'll hang up. Thanks for covering the show today. And uh, whether you go to Purdue and the the, the ghost of Gene Cady or the ghost of Judd Heathcote, they both, uh, I guess, painters a lot more uh, behave than uh, Cady, but he still uh, he still is tough and intimidates coaches. So uh, let's get home to the friendly confines and let's put a string together. Thanks for taking my call. Thanks, Lomansky. You bet. Good to have you. Before we get to our next caller here, I do want to address a couple comments in the chat. Um, first of all, Mr. Wink Wink, he says, um, let me pull up here. Um, sorry for the delay on that. We're going to put our next caller on hold. Uh, he says, only one ranked team in the Big Ten currently wins over ISU, Michigan, Rutgers, Iowa is going to need to win a lot to be in the tournament. Iowa is a bubble team right now. That is just a fact. No negativity here. Well, do we trust Oink Oink or do we trust Joe Lunardi has been doing this for years? As of right now, do you want to know where Joe Lunardi's got Iowa? He's got him as an eight seed. So that's, what, four seed lines from being uh, from being on the bubble, right, per se? So I, I don't buy that. Again, we got three. You got three games in front of them right now. They're solidly in. I'm not saying they can't fall out of the field, but to say they need a lot to go their way, that's just inaccurate. I, I just don't agree with it. Um, and Gary, I mean, I don't know how you feel about the resume. We obviously know about the Eastern Illinois loss. Chris brings that up. He says uh, that game makes this these types of losses more painful. It's going to stick out on Selection Sunday. It's going to hurt them regardless if they make the tournament or not, because it's going to hurt them in seeding. But as of right now, the people that do this for a living still believe that I was a tournament team. And they are. I think every, every place you look at, that, that is the case. I'm surprised in some respects with the, the amount of uh, respect the Big Ten's getting with, like one, with only one team in the top 25, but it just must be the case in college basketball all around. Um, I haven't seen anything less than 10 teams in in any of the brackets, and most of those guys are fairly – are fairly close. They may have the seating off a little bit, but they usually they get the, the teams right down to a, just a couple. Uh, so I, I agree with you. I think they are in right now. Like, you know, there's, there's a lot of basketball to play. They can play the Sims out or they can play themselves into a better seed. Uh, there's still work to be done, but um, the work so far appears to be good enough to have them in. So uh, the comment here from, uh, from uh, the real Hayden, and we're going to get to our caller here in a second. Uh, thank you for the super chat donation, Real Hayden. But he says, I'm sorry if I came off too strong in the comments. I just don't understand why two things can't be true at the same time. Isn't it true that six of 13 from free throw line and Chris's one field goal in the second half is unacceptable while also saying you had two good looks at the end to win in East Lansing? Sure. But to say unacceptable, like maybe you and I just have a difference of opinions. But when I look at the six of 13, I say, you just had a bad night. Those are going to happen. <laughs> there isn't a team that I'm aware of Gary in the modern era that shoots 80 to 90% every game. There, there's going to be games like this. Yeah. And I'm just saying their track record says they're a, their average is their second best in the conference in conference play. So that's why I'm not, yes, it's, it's very frustrating that they went six of 13 from the free throw line. It's the, the Chris situation we can address Gary. And I see yeah. several people wanting you to address it. Uh, Chris has not had this issue since maybe, when they were in Florida, I mean, we were talking about how physical TCU and Clemson were, and and it kind of suppressed Chris, and, and you just he kind of disappeared as those games went on. I kind of saw shades of that again tonight, and even Fox talked about that in their uh, brief post game coverage that he kind of disappeared. What was going on with Chris, and how do you uh, fix that moving forward? 
Well, I mean, uh, it'd be easier maybe to go back and look at the tape and just, you know, see what was going on. He, he did not look as active and as aggressive as he normally is for whatever reason. Now, some of that might be Michigan State and, you know, how they're guarding him. But, um, you know, he's he's got to he's got to perform well. The, the margin of error is such that we, we need something for him. Uh, and I would say that's as big a deal. And the three for 17 as the free throws are. Um, you know, you make one or two more free throws and you go eight for 13 or nine for 13, you're not even talking about. It. And I know that's the difference between winning and losing, but three for 17 um, to me stands out even more than the free throws. Um, and then, and Chris, um, you know, not getting, you know, there were times when I watched, he, he didn't, he didn't go to the glass and usually he's a pretty aggressive offensive rebounder. So I didn't think he was um, as aggressive, as active, as he normally is. And, and guys are going to have games like that. I mean, that's just, that's just basketball. I'm sure he'll bounce back, but it just goes to show you how, how important he is and in, in the team's success and the pressure that he's got on him because he's got to deliver uh, just about every night uh, for, for Iowa to win. Thank you, Hayden. I do appreciate your super chat. And Hayden has been a part of this show in the chat for, as long as the show and, and as long as content here from the Hawkeye, the storm has been around. So I love you, Hayden. And it's, it's nothing uh, personal. I, I just, we have a difference of opinion to some extent, but the proof will be in the pudding. If these, if, if for some reason, all of a sudden they've turned into a bad free throw shooting team, then yeah, that's a big problem. But I just don't think that's, that's the case. And it is, it, I mean, Fran, there's no question. Fran is, that was a big part of it. Free three point shooting. We're not talking about enough, Gary, you just talked about it. Very rarely is Iowa even going to be in a game on the road. When you make how many threes in this game did they make? Um, they made three. They made three threes. <laughs> That's yeah. incredible. That's an in- incredible stat. So, anyways, um, and they had two at the very end. You know, that, so up until then they were three for fifteen, and tried to get a you know try to get a three to um, you know win the game. So, by the way, Bart, referring to Chris Murray as soft, he's going to be a first round dra- uh, first round draft pick, Bart. So how many, how many offensive rebounds did he have tonight? Chris had three offensive rebounds. Uh, 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 yes, three, 11 total. That's decent. That's decent. 11 rebounds. Yeah, that, that's how good he is. I mean, it, he puts up numbers and you're going, God, he didn't play very well. Um, and he he didn't, uh, you know, he didn't get enough shots uh, in a second half. But you got to give some credit to the defense. It's not like they're playing against a bunch of stiffs. But again, to say he's soft. The NBA, he's going to be a first round draft pick. I think it would take a lot, but you just watch. And I mean, maybe you don't agree, but we said the same thing about Keegan last year. And Keegan was a lottery pick, and now Keegan is perhaps rookie of the year. Anyways, uh, let's get to our next caller who's been on hold. Thank you for calling Iowa post game with Coach Gary Close, who's on the line. Hi, Corey. Hi, Gary. Um, this is uh, Tom from McGregor or Ryan from McGregor. How you guys doing tonight? Good, Ryan. How are you? Oh, not bad. I uh, noticed that Corey's kind of in a foul mood <laughs> and uh, thought I would uh, lighten up the conversation a little bit tonight with uh, something a little different. I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to play an excerpt off my computer and hopefully you'll be able to hear it. And um, I found it while looking up a rumor that I'd heard about a guy that attended Loris College that played for the Harlem Globetrotters. And I didn't believe that um, because I didn't know about this guy. And I went to school there. And uh, it's true enough. His name was Boo Johnson. And he did play for the Globetrotters. And it was a phenomenal dribbler. And I think he was at Loris around 1985. But anyway, I was researching this on the Harlem Globetrotters site. And uh, did a couple links and got to a site on Britannica.com that talks about... um, the history of basketball so i'm going to play this for you if you guys can hear it let me know okay okay sure this for you if you guys can hear it let me know okay oh whoops i'm gonna have a problem because um well i'm gonna have to read it for you um and this comes from this side i thought maybe it would play on my playback on uh word but that's not going to work the first college to play the game was either geneva college beaver falls pennsylvania or the University of Iowa. C.O. Bemis heard about the new sport at Springfield and tried it out with his students at Geneva in 1892. 
at Iowa, H.F. Collenberg, who had attended Springfield in 1890, wrote Naismith for a copy of the rules and also presented the game to his students. At Springfield, Collenberg met Amos Alonzo Stagg, who became athletic director at the New University of Chicago in 1892. The first college basketball game with five on, on a side was played between the University of Chicago and the University of Iowa in Iowa City on January 18, 1896. The University of Chicago won 15 to 12 with neither team using a substitute. Colin Berg referred that game, refereed that game, a common practice in that era, and some of the spectators took exception to some of his decisions, which I felt was appropriate for Corey's foul mood this evening. Well, anyway, I did not know that, and I don't know if this is true because I don't know about this source, but if it's so, then with the University of Chicago no longer in the Big Ten, Iowa is the birthplace of Big Ten basketball, and I think that's fascinating. Did you guys you know go. that? Do you know that, Gary? I know I knew some of it, but not, not, not completely, so I'm glad he, he filled in the blanks there a little bit. I think that'd be kind of neat to have on on uh, Carver Hawkeye Arena, home of Big Ten basketball. I I birthed the Big Ten basketball. I think that kind of has a nice little ring to it. So uh, there you go. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, the game was disappointing. It was a weird game because there were a lot of key moments where there were momentum shifts. It looked like I was going to score, and then Michigan State gets a ball and transitions, and it's like a four point swing and. It just seemed to happen quite a bit. I thought Philip Robach played really well inside. I was surprised at how much uh, Fran intentionally went to him. Um, but he, he performed well since we weren't shooting threes from the perimeter very well at all. And if we don't shoot well, we generally have nights like tonight. So yeah. anyway, that, that's all I had. But I thought I would lighten up the show a little bit with a little historical fact. I'll let you go. Appreciate it, Ryan. Thanks for the call. Thanks for the call. Yeah, good stuff. Um, did not know that. That that that'll have to be. I'll have to do some research myself. Um, Chad says, "Go 49ers, Kittle and Purdy." Sorry about that. Yeah, that's, are you torn at all? You're not torn. You're an Eagles fan. Uh, but it's it, it's kind of a cool storyline. Iowa boys, uh, no doubt. You know, and, the, and Kittle is related to Jess Sells. Okay, um, he is. I think he's married to um, he through marriage, either married to a cousin or uh, something. Well, he's married. Some... To, he's married to Claire Till, who is okay. a former volleyball player at Iowa, and her brother was Riley Till, who played under Fran. Okay. Um, but you're saying that the Tills are related um, to the Settles? I think so. I'm gonna have to ask Jess. I thought he told me that. Maybe it was some somebody else, but I, I could have sworn it was Kittle. All right, let's get to our next caller here. Thank you for calling Iowa Post Game with Coach Gary Close. Who's on the line? Uh, this is Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. Hey, Gary. Um, Gary, when you were coaching, how did you determine to build a team? Did you look at metrics? Did you look at the eye test? What determined the five players that you put on the court and your substitution patterns? Well, that's a good question. Um, when I was coaching, there, was, there wasn't as much metrics as there is now. Um, it's, be, you know, it's becoming more and more prevalent in, in all sports. Drives me crazy a little bit. But um, I think anytime you, you, you want to get as much, much information as you crazy. get. Um but I think we 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 told we you know we told our players hey you're you're going to decide by how you play on the on the court and how you how you practice how you're improving and and we're going to put um, you know we're going to put the guys out there that we think's got the best chance to win so it's it's more earning your spot and um, you know some of that's uh, you know evaluation looking at stats and things like that so that's some of it's just gut just watching you know watching what they're doing and and uh, and some of his chemistry and things like that. So it changes from year to year. But um, I think every, every player has got to understand they've got a, they've got a chance to, 
um, to compete for playing time. And they're the ones that are going to decide how much minutes they get by how well they play. So you mentioned improvement. How do you measure it? Well, you measure it. You can measure it through through stats. You know, their shooting percentages go up. Um, you can measure it through watching tape. Uh, their defense is improving. They're not getting beat off the ball as much. The rebounding is improving. They're checking out better. Um, video is a real good uh, way to way to teach. I mean, they, they always say film doesn't lie. And uh, you know, if somebody doesn't believe. You know, I, I could I could take Aaron Eulis and I could show him his six turnovers and what he did to get those turnovers and how, what he could do to prevent those from happening again. Now the question is, will he do it? Um, and I think he's the type of player that would. Um, and then then and then you look at their progress. Um, what you when you really get upset is when people make the same mistakes over and over and over again. Uh, because either uh, they're not good enough to change them or they don't care enough to, to change them. And neither one of those options are very good. Uh, and so we used a lot of film. Um, after every game, we broke film down either individually or as a team. And you know, here's some things that we did well. Here's some things we, you know, here, here's our turnovers. And how do we how do we prevent ourselves from having more turnovers like these? Um, Aaron Ulis is a good example. He gets a lot of turnovers over dribbling and, and dribbling into traffic where there's a lot of other defenders. And if you do that, you better be strong with the ball because it's going to get stripped and not all those calls are going to be made. I, I can just, I can just tell you that's not going to happen. And in some cases he might very well be getting fouled. Um, but if he's not strong with the ball, um, Officials are human, and they a lot of times they will not give him that call. So he's got to learn to pick his spots on when he penetrates. If he sees different colored jerseys, he got to retreat, dribble, and get out of there. You know, some of his turnovers, he jumps up in the air and tries to make a pass. That's that's just fundamentally not being strong. So you show him that, and then it's their job to improve. And um, and for the most part, this team has done that. Do you think an athletic director measures improvement differently than you did as a coach? And if they do, how so? Uh, that's a good question. I think, um, I think athletic directors are all, are all different. I think they, you know, they, I think basically they're going to look at their, their team and, and what are, what are their reasonable aspirations and goals? And if the teams aren't. No, no, Gary, Gary. They shouldn't look at their team. They should look at the coach. I don't think an athletic director looks at the team. They look at the coach. Well, I think they. I think they look at how the team's performing, and if it's not performing the way they like, what's the reason? Um, so, what and, are the metrics for the athletic director to determine if the team is not performing, quote, how they like? Is that wins and losses? Is pretty much, pretty much. Or is um, it metrics? No, I, I, I doubt they look at metrics a lot. I, you know, I could be wrong. I, I think it's more. You don't I think, think Larry Barta pays any attention to the metrics? And if what, he what, me, well, what metrics are you talking about? What metrics? Okay. I'm, I'm going to go to defensive metrics over the last. 10 years in Fran McCaffrey's era. Yeah. A final four team in the NCAA has never been to the final four being below 70th in defense. How many okay. times has Iowa been in the top 50 in defensive efficiency in the last 10 years? What? So you, you're you asking Gary, a question Gary, that we all know the answer. You, you're, answer. Asking, answer, you're asking a question that we all know the answer to. So what's your point? No, no. We, we okay. all know the answer. So they have not been the top 50 so at all. We, we know that. Do you, think, do you think Gary Barta knows how many times Iowa has been in the top 50 in defensive efficiency in the last 10 years? Do I, you think Gary Barta can answer that question tonight? I'm sure he would say probably never, as he would he would say about the offense 
under Brian Ferentz. It's all about wins and Corey, losses. Corey, athletic directors. No, no, no. Probably. Hold on. You're not going to cut me up. It's all about who's who's coming to games. Are there are there the donors still giving? Are they winning enough to get into the tournament? That's what the standard is at Iowa. That's what the standard is. Whether you agree okay, with it okay, or not, you, that's what the standard is. They're not firing that's a Fran. Good answer, Corey. They're not. Well, that's what it is. You don't have to like it. I'm not saying you have to. I'm not saying I like it. I'm just saying that's the standard. Wins and losses, and regardless of how they get to the wins and losses, that's the standard. Okay. the The only thing that was interesting to me is when you said he probably knows. I think the athletic director should know exactly, precisely how many times a, a team has finished in the top fifty. Not probably. Well, that's kind of an arbitrary. Uh, that's kind of an arbitrary stat to say. Well, should we should be measuring it based on how many times he's been in the top fifty in one category? I mean, you may feel very strongly on that, and there have been there have been analysts that have pointed that stat out as an indicator of possible tournament success, but that's kind of an arbitrary number to throw out to any AD. Corey, Corey, it's not arbitrary. No final four team. I know we, we've heard final that. Four. I get it. I get it. All right. Any, anything else for coach close? We're not going to no. talk in circles. We got an hour show here. I'm not going to talk in circles about this subject. If you want to get me during one of my live shows where we got two to three hours to talk, we can do that, but I don't want to tie up the line for the rest of this show. Fair enough. I, fair enough. I, I capitulate. Thank okay. you. Appreciate the call, sir. I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm just, <laughs> you know, we're just going to talk in circles. I understand the yeah. point of, of our caller there. He, he's frustrated because the defense isn't better year in and year out, but of all nights to call in and complain about defense, it's tonight. Right. I, you know, I, I appreciate our caller calling in and I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'd be happy to discuss it. Believe me, I'm happy to discuss it on another show. We've got a limited time with coach close. We've already went over. So, you know, again, appreciate the call and we'll, we'll discuss that on another day. And he's not wrong. I don't think, I don't think you can say he's wrong. It's just uh, maybe not the time and the place to discuss it uh, at length. Well, the other thing is it's so hard to get to the final four. I mean, that is such a, I mean, people just think, oh, that can be done any, I mean, it's, 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 it's difficult. I, I coached 29 years of major college bass. I got there twice uh, in 29 years. And a couple of times I was close. It just, it doesn't happen. And so if you're going to grade your program on how many times they go to the final four, uh, you're going to be firing a lot of coaches because uh, it just doesn't happen very often. Yeah. And, and again, uh that we have a very kind of an odd situation in Iowa with Iowa athletics, the two major revenue sports, Iowa football and Iowa basketball, both winning games and winning enough to where the men's basketball team is basically getting in the tournament every year for the most part, every year football, you're, you're, you're getting to a bowl games every year. You're competing for the West pretty much every year, but yet you're doing it in spite of one aspect of the game. I mean, nobody's denying that the, the Iowa football's offense has been bad for quite some time. And Iowa basketball's defense has been pretty bad for quite some time, but, and, and you may have different values as a fan and say, well, I, I believe that we have to shoot for the stars and we need to fire people. That is not how Gary Barta sees it. I mean, I think we agree on that. And I don't know that it would be as easy as we make it out to be. If, if, if I'm in Gary Barta's situation, Gary, or if you're in Gary Barta's situation, are you saying we're firing you, Fran, because you don't know how to coach defense? They've been to the tournament a lot, and it's hard to sustain that type of success. We all want Sweet 16s, Elite 8s, Final 4s. It's just hard to sit, not making – I know everybody will say I'm making excuses for Fran. I'm not trying to do that. But it, it, as you said, it's hard to win in the tournament. It is. It's, 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 there's no, there's no question about it. It's uh, there's a lot of other teams that are trying to do it. And a lot of those teams have advantages over Iowa. Uh, and when I was at Wisconsin, they had, they had distinct advantages um, in a lot of ways. So, Hey, that's, that sounds like an excuse, um, but it's also reality. And so when you, when you get on a run or you do something, well, you got to appreciate it because trust me, it's tough to do. Barbara says that Gary, you're right. Uh, George and uh, Jess are first cousins, and that's what Kittle says. Kittle's, Kittle's <laughs> mom is Jess's, and, and Je Kittle's mom is Jess. Okay, I'm trying to figure out. This is no, correctly. Okay, they're sisters, so they're actually mm -hmm. first cousins. Then that can't be sounds right. Like, yeah, sounds like it. 
Yeah. There's too much of an age difference there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, not really with how, you know, just uh, maybe a little bit, <laughs> but uh, some of those families, they got like 12 kids. So maybe they're one end or the other. Um, okay. Jet pilot wants to know how officials are monitored from game to game, week to week. I've always wondered what keeps one from betting on a game and trying to manipulate scores. Uh, you mean the officials betting on the game? Yeah. Yeah. How, uh, how, how does that I mean? Is a conference reviewing every game? Every, it's, every game it's, gets reviewed. Every game gets reviewed. There's a, wow. there's a directive officials in the big 10 and uh, trust me, he gets phone calls every day from, from coaches pointing out things that are not going, they're not going well and, and so on and so forth. So they're, they're evaluated. And like we mentioned, they're evaluating the NCAA tournament and they have bad game. They're out. Uh, so, um, and I, I, I think that's fair for me to say, I think the big 10 is probably the most sought after league to officiate in. And um, they get, I know a lot of people don't get, they get the top of the line of the officials. There's not, there's um, uh, that, that's been the case for a long time. Doesn't mean they don't screw up. Doesn't mean they have bad games because they do. Trust me, I've been through a few. But year in and year out, generally speaking, the Big Ten has the best officials in the country. Okay, let's going to go quick fire here because we've we've passed our our time limit here. Uh, Zach wants to know why is Sanford why was Sanford not playing more than he did? What did Michigan State? I think Michigan State just kind of took him out of what he does best, and that's shoot threes they made it difficult on him to get good looks is that what you would attribute Fran kind of turning away from Peyton down the stretch yeah maybe a little bit and uh you know Udos was playing pretty well and uh he he tends to sub a little less in the second half um and uh he he, he put him in position to win a game I mean it, it, I don't think we can ask for much more than that we we we've we've said it's almost almost too much one shot goes in and everybody's just got a totally different attitude so um, I would say that if we went into that game knowing that, Hey, we'll, we got the ball, uh, down two with 15 seconds to go in the game. Will we take it? I think probably 90% of the calls would take that. And, uh, unfortunately we didn't, we didn't knock it down. Steve says, Corey thoughts on Connor. Uh, I saw the dialogue in the chat again. I'm going to disagree with several people in here. I, I, I really like Connor McCaffrey. I'm going to be sad when he leaves. I think he does a lot more than people realize. Um, he's not shot quite as well from three or the last few games, but not really, no. for the season, he shot very well from three and he's, he's a, a floor general. He's, he's going to take care of the bat. He's not a, a guy who's going to turn the ball over. No, um, He's good at getting the ball down low to, to Phillip and his Phillips game has evolved. I think Connor's skill set. uh, makes him more apt to play more. And also when Patrick is out, Connor's going to play more. They're thin. He's going to play a lot of minutes. So he's a sixth year senior, right? Is that, that right? Is yeah. he a sixth year senior? So, I mean, I, I, that's, those are my thoughts on Connor. Uh, the real Hayden appreciate the super chat here. 15 to 12 score in five on five is unacceptable. Uh, what are we talking about? I think he's making a joke here. I think you must be. appreciate the super <laughs> chat. Nevertheless, yeah. um, Tony says, I guess in the post game, uh, Connor said he was trying to call a timeout in the final seconds after the first shot. The officials didn't hear him, so he passed it out to Sanford for the second miss. And uh, Barbara thought the, the last call was really good, just bad luck. The shots didn't go down. Bart mm -hmm. says, uh, Lenardi's bracketology, I was an eight seed is before this loss. Gary, let's teach our listeners, uh, at least Bart, something about how the tournament works. Losing on the road at East Lansing is not going to move them down four to five seed lines. All right. It may not move them down one seed line. All right. You lose by two on the road at East Lansing down Patrick McCaffrey. It ain't moving them down that much. Now, if they go lose at home, like I say, they lose two of the next three at home. Then we're starting to think, okay, you got to start winning games, stealing some on the road. But I, I doubled down on what I said earlier. The Tigers in. got Maryland and Penn state in it. I mean, it's uh, that's right now. The consensus is that, um, the Big Ten's going to get 10, maybe 11 teams, and that could change, but um, it hasn't changed all year. That's That's been the number from the get-go, so I, I I can't believe they're all wrong. Rick says, why isn't the leading scorer in the Big Ten taking the last shot? 
boy, I, I just can't complain with a wide open three for Peyton Sanford. I, I'd take that over a contested shot for Chris Murray any day of the week. That's my opinion. Gary, maybe you don't feel the same way, but uh, no, no problem. I, I, I thought it was, I thought it was a, uh, that was a good call. And unfortunately it didn't go down. Um, uh, no, I, I thought it was a good move. Rick says, uh, why doesn't Iowa have college students surround the court first 10 rows like Michigan State? I actually talked with Fran McCaffrey about this during one of the preseason shows. So if you missed that, go back and watch. It was one of the uh, games right before the season back in November. And uh, Fran acted optimistic that there are going to be some seating changes down the line. Now, when those will occur, I'm not sure. But he he was optimistic about, you know, you got to figure out a way for the big donors to be happy still. But if you can move them and still make them happy, then you can put students behind benches and and perhaps generate that type of a crowd. When they built that facility, I, I mean, I was there, you know, the first, first when that facility opened, what they did is, is they, they, they built the student section all the way around and built the section above that high enough that if the students stood the whole game, which they expected them to do, that the people in the first row of those next seats would not be, their, their vision would not be blocked. And that's the problem with all these other arenas is now you put them, you ring them around the end, then the people that are behind them are going to complain because they're standing up and they can't see. And in some cases, that's some of the biggest donors you've had in the history of your program. So you got, you got a real problem there. Michigan state was smart enough that when they built the arena, said, all right, well, let's try to figure something out. And that's how they did it. They built the facility. Those are all benches right behind the benches going all the way around so those students can stand. And then all the seats behind those benches are high enough that they can sit uh, even when the students are standing. And it was smart. Um, could they do that to Carver-Hawkeye Arena? I don't know. I mean, it, it would not be easy, but maybe maybe they can and maybe they will. Um, but that's the problem you have in literally every other arena with almost every single exception in the Big Ten. That's the way it is, except for Michigan State. Purdue's up one side in the end. Um, Wisconsin's up one end. Um, I mean, literally every – I think Illinois is maybe the other one they've got it around. I think that facility is somewhat similar. So part of it's just the construction of the arena that makes it difficult. Kerry says, uh, I'm curious, Coach, what would you have the team focus on after a game like this? Is there something you would normally do to help with the effect of a close loss? Well, I think anytime you want to be honest and you want to you want to – Tell it like it is. I think, you know, without looking at the tape and and really getting an idea just from watching one time, I thought the effort was terrific. I thought they put themselves in a great chance to win the game. I think what they'll do is go back and look at some areas like the turnovers, for example, or some defensive breakdowns. Here's where we've got to get better. And then you got to move on. And then you got to get ready for uh, Rutgers because they're good. And you can't dwell on it too much or you're going to string three, four, five games in a row because the league is, is too, uh, too close. So learn from, uh, from what this happened. Appreciate the effort. Um, I think every coach, when they go into a game, especially a game like this, they want to have a chance to win the game. That's, what they, that's their first responsibility or, or goal is let's be in position to win it. And they were. And got a good look to do it, and just um, you know, just didn't quite quite get it done. So there were a lot of positives. Let's shore up the negatives, and let's get ready to play Saturday. What's the elbow? You use that phrase. Zach wants to know. Yeah, the elbow is where the free throw and the lane line come together. Oh, that elbow. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right, folks. As a reminder, as a recap, the Michigan State Spartans defeating the Hawkeyes into the side of the Breslin Center in East Lansing. Michigan State snapping a three-game losing streak to Iowa. Interestingly enough, Iowa's had Michigan State's number as of late, including in East Lansing. Sanford, that's Peyton Sanford, had two three-point shots in the final five seconds to potentially win the game for the Hawkeyes. How about Aaron Euless? Despite the six turnovers, 17 points, 13 of which came in the second half, reaching double figures for the season for the second straight game, had 12 on Saturday. We forget that in the losing effort at Ohio State. Philip Rebracha had 16 points, game best. 11 rebounds, two blocks for his team best, eighth double-double of the season. He scored 15-plus for the seventh time in Iowa's last 10 games, reaching double figures for the 13th time in 14 contests. The Hawkeyes are now 2-2 two and two in games, despite it by three points or less. Iowa made six free throws, their fewest in a game since making five at Nebraska back in December. 
The Hawkeyes, three three-pointers made equal to season low. They had three against TCU and against Duke. Four different Hawkeyes scored a field goal in the first four minutes, starting the game on a 10-0 run. And, of course, another game without Patrick McCaffrey. Josh Agundale is still out, um, but the Hawkeyes fighting. And we get a game on uh, Sunday now at 1 p.m. Uh, I see, you know, we've gotten the banner Iowa post game with Coach Gary Close. Just stay tuned. If you're not following me on Twitter, we'll figure out a, a time for the show for Iowa post game with Coach Gary Close and recap of Iowa Rutgers. But if you're not following me already, be sure to do that. I'll keep people posted on social media. Uh, you can follow me at from the Hawkeye. And we find the banner here at from the Hawkeye on Twitter or Instagram from the Hawkeye of the storm on Facebook. A reminder, we've got merchandise in our description. We've got an Amazon link to support the show by making purchases, daily purchases through Amazon, sharing the link out in social media of this show helps. Uh, and of course, donating by means of PayPal, cash app, Venmo, et cetera. And you can sponsor the show. If you're interested in doing that, any of our content, reach out to me. Uh, from the eye of the storm at outlook.com from the eye of the storm at outlook.com and to become a premium subscriber you can do so by clicking the join button as always so uh, gary go eagles I, I mean i don't know who i'm rooting for yet in that game because i do like the purdy kittle story but i've seen the niners in the super bowl recently i mean the eagles weren't hadn't been that long since nick Foles and the eagles were were there but uh it will be an entertaining sunday and we'll get a lot mm-hmm. of sports two big games in the pros and then of course Iowa Rutgers, a game Iowa needs early in the afternoon on Sunday. Yeah, great game. All right, folks, for Coach Gary Close, I'm Corey Brad here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Take care, and we will talk to you soon.